Hello, it's Zoe Routh, and I'm here with the tremendously amazing Alessandra Edwards, who I've had the pleasure of both interviewing before and working with over the last year or two. And I'm delighted about what we're talking about today, which is advanced biohacking for supercharged professionals. And here's a little bit of her official bio. I'm going to read it out because it's impressive, just like she is. So Alessandra Edwards is a peak performance expert with over a decade's experience working at the cutting edge of tailored health and ultra wellness programs. I love that ultra wellness. I'm up for that. Uh, for corporate and government leaders, elite athletes, and high flyers locally and internationally. She has a background in health science with a post-grad professional certificate in genetics and genomics, no idea what the difference is between those two, from Stanford University, which is very impressive, uh, as well as a decade of clinical nutritional practice. So Alessandra equips leaders and teams who are feeling tired, wired, and frustrated, and how this is affecting their professional and personal performance. And she gives us simple, effective, scientific solutions to unlock unstoppable energy, vitality, and resilience. I feel like I needed to have like an American voiceover for that. <laughs> <laughs> but that sounds really good. I don't, I don't remember writing it, but as you said, it's like, wow, that sounds really good. Is that me? <laughs> I, I love bios because it's like, wow, it's like the ultimate version of self where wow. meanwhile, it's like we're Ultra rushing. Ultra wellness. <laughs> Ultra wellness. <laughs> so welcome, Alessandra. And Alessandra has just come in from the gym. So she's, she says she's a bit sweaty. I think she looks, looks fabulous. All right. So since we last did our last interview, which is about a, over a year ago, I think, what's the latest thing you've been learning and working on when it comes to executive performance? I become really, really interested in understanding the fine tuning of circadian rhythms <clears throat> for optimal performance. So let me break that down a little bit. Um, so uh, probably many of your listeners are familiar with the term circadian cycle in terms of sleep. So that basically is the sleep wake cycle. And there's a heap of blogs out there that talk about, you know, sleep optimization. Uh, many people now have heard that blue light at night from screens is, you know, detrimental to our sleep. And so um, there's been a lot of, uh, you know, information and little tips and hacks on here are the things you should do, you know, the, the wind down in the hour before sleep and that, you know, it's really important. And, it's, and, and whilst that is important, it seemed to me that I didn't quite understand why we should put so much emphasis on just 60 minutes or 90 minutes before sleep where, you know, what happens for the rest of the day. And so it turns out that kind of, uh, that's not misinformation, but it's literally like zooming in with your lens on <clears throat> such a small aspect of the whole puzzle, which is the sleep-wake cycle. And so <clears throat> that's really focusing very much on our internal clock that's in the brain and very much responds to light cues. So if you imagine that our genes have evolved over hundreds and hundreds of thousands of years, and it's relatively recently that we've got electricity, then it kind of makes sense to think that, okay, well, we're literally tricking our brain into thinking that it is not sunset, it's not nighttime because we've got electricity, okay, or we're looking at screens. However, it's a lot more uh, detailed and interesting than that because it turns out that we actually have um, clocks that are not just in the brain, but we have peripheral clocks that are also based throughout our body. And these responses from, you know, cues from the environment, so the lights that we're exposed to or the darkness, but they also respond to timed eating and exercise. Okay, pause, so, pause. I got to digest all that. Okay. Uh, so press pause. And also, I think your microphone is jiggling against something in front of you. Oh. Yeah. So there's a bit of a snappling, scratching oh, I sound. I couldn't hear it. I can hear it. <laughs> okay. So that's okay. If, it's, if, it's, if you can tr keep it from jiggling, that would be the... It. Yeah. Okay. I'll try not to move so much. Okay, cool. Um, so basically, circadian rhythms are affected by our contemporary society, uh, specifically light rhythms and blue light blockers, uh, a blue light coming from screens and so on, um, which 
yeah, I have my, I have my yellow blue light blockers that I, my orange blue light blockers I put on at night. And are you finding that it's true that the, the screen time and artificial light is having a major impact on our circadian rhythms, our natural sleep patterns? It depends on the person. I found for people that is significant. And for others, changing that does not really give them the gains in terms of both length and quality of sleep that they wish for. What? Really? So, you know, some, for some people it is and some people it, it, it doesn't? Yeah, so I'm not saying that it is not a good habit, yeah, to turn down the lights and, um, um, you know, do the wind down routines because those are specific cues that tend, tell our nervous system, okay, it's time to, it's, we're not in work mode anymore, we're winding down, it's time to produce the neurotransmitters that uh, foster good sleep. However, I have found that it really depends on the person how much of an impact that has. So I'll give you an example. Um, I recently worked with an executive who um, was having significant sleep issues, okay? And then I worked with someone else who worked in a different industry, but still working very long hours and also had sleep issues. And we started tracking their sleep architecture. So we're actually, what, what this means is basically, um, so the sleep architecture is the frame upon which you know, your sleep is constructed, if you like. And we all have patterns that go on every night. So we're going to you know, uh, light sleep, you know, REM sleep, you know, deep sleep. So th there's different cycles, okay? And we all need to have a balance between these cycles. Now, we implemented exactly the same wind down strategies with you know, yellow lens, blue light, blue light blockers, um, same brand. Um, we did exactly the same wind down and for one person, that really changed the level of deep sleep they had. And for the other person, it made no difference at all. Ah. However, when for the other person, we actually removed caffeine because we knew that genetically they were not very well adapted. And they had a very slow caffeine detoxifier gene. The sleep architecture changed entirely. So this is what... You know, I just like to, to say that um, by all means, you can try out all these things like the blue light blockers, you know, making sure that you turn off your laptop, you know, an hour and a half before you go to bed. But don't despair that if your sleep quality does not improve, there may be other things at play. So one of them could be, for example, caffeine. The other thing, uh, and actually with caffeine, I, I'd like to explain why that is because we tend to think of caffeine as a stimulant, which it is, right? So it releases, um, you know, adrenaline and cortisol. So it has that kind of stimulatory effect. However, when it comes to sleep, the main issue with caffeine is that it interferes with something called sleep pressure. So we all build up sleep pressure throughout the day and it's directed by a chemical or adenosine. We all have this. So throughout the day, from the moment we wake up, adenosine starts to build up and melatonin, which is the sleep hormone, goes down. So as adenosine builds up and up and up, yeah, it just keeps sitting on receptors in the brain that are linked to sleep. When it gets to the evening and adenosine has got to its maximum level, we literally just fall asleep. We're too tired. Okay, and this is why when you um, miss sleep, yeah, and they've done studies to see how long can a person go without sleeping, eventually they just cannot help themselves. Like literally, the rational part of your brain cannot override this because adenosine just keeps building and building and building and is only reset and removed from the receptors once you have slept. The cinch is this though, caffeine sits on exact receptors as adenosine. So it basically moves the sleep pressure out of the way. Mm. And if you're not breaking down caffeine because of whatever, you know, genetic variance you have, then it's just going to sit and sit and sit on these sleep receptors. And adenosine is just going around with nowhere to sit. So it's going to be impacting your ability to, you know, to fall asleep or go back to sleep yeah, when you're awake. Wow. So, so that's one, one point. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so I'm a, uh, I don't metabolize caffeine as well. That's one thing that we discovered in our work yeah. together. And thank goodness I gave up coffee ages ago. Um, 
But that's really fascinating that that caffeine can bump off adenosine. Um, so just on your point about there's been research, how long can you go without sleeping? How long can you go before your body just goes and can clock? I know you were, were going to ask me that. And uh, <laughs> I, di- I didn't look up the exact day, but it's actually, it's, it's quite a lot. It's longer than, than you think. From memory, I think it might be something like five days. Oh my goodness. Um, but, you know, not, not doing very well. Like really, you start losing function, body function. But don't quote me on it because, um, in fact, it might be a lot less. But it's, it's um, um, what was really interesting looking at those studies is to see how literally without sleep, your body completely breaks down and people can end up with um, psychotic episodes, you know, hallucinations. Um, and obviously, it's an extreme way to prove to ourselves how important sleep is. But I think it's a useful thing um, to remember. And I think this is one of the things that I notice about a lot of people in you know, professional circles, that there is a little bit of this kind of myth that goes around um, of self-delusion, <laughs> what I call the self-delusion bubble, <laughs> that, that we all like to think that we are really stronger that, than we really are. And many, many, many people who um, are 100% convinced that they can function on five hours of sleep a night, five, six hours, and that's all they need. And, you know, we've got some great examples also in history, like, you know, um, Margaret Thatcher was famously quoted to say she only needed, you know, four hours of sleep. Well, you know, she ended up with dementia. Uh, so, <laughs> <laughs> um, and uh, so the thing is, when you actually look into it, it turns out that this notion that, oh, I can function well on, you know, four hours sleep, five hours sleep, and, and I'm totally fine with it. it it's a complete myth because um, you actually have a higher chance of being hit by lightning than you have of having the specific genes required to sustain well-being uh, and energy without sleep, you know, just with four hours sleep. So... When, so when you look at these stats, you kind of realize why we're all basically chronically underslept. And a lot of cases of, you know, I work with a lot of people that are really very high performers. And so they're, they're really trying to access that extra one, two, three percent that's going to give them an extra edge. OK, one of the things that I hear a lot is that when people are tired, they say, look, I generally function absolutely fine, but I have these cycles of brain fog. And, uh, and I'm sure that it's just to do with a bit of aging. So I'd like to put it out there that brain fog is never normal <laughs> <laughs> at, at any age. <clears throat> and um, the number one thing to look at manipulating yourself, and you don't need any coaching for this, you, you, you don't need to pay any money, is to actually sleep an extra one or two hours a night for a week. Just do that and see what happens to the brain fog. Now, if you still have the brain fog after that, there might be other things related to, you know, blood sugar metabolism, you know, thyroid, but that, that is a, a very simple key intervention that I recommend to everybody. Okay, so long story short, sleep is important. Uh, caffeine has an impact potentially. Um, we need more than what we're getting. What are some other things that would cause people to not sleep well? So they've got their sleep architecture right in terms of um, what they're doing before bed and how they set up their bedroom. They've quit caffeine. They're not doing caffeine before bed. What else might cause sleep disturbance? Uh, sleep, um, time, timing of eating, food timing. Yeah. And I, I love to kind of put a spanner in the works because all these things I talk about are exactly the things that are actually quite, you know, potentially challenging to implement, you know, if you <laughs> are working long hours. But um, the thing is, when we eat has also been shown to impact the kind of sleep we have. And this is because if we have a late dinner, our heart rate is going to be higher. Yeah. And, and and this is going to impact heart rate variability overnight. So the quicker our heart rate can settle into a uh, calmer state, so a lower beat, the deeper and more restorative the sleep is going to be. So whether it's kind of, you know, um, some of my clients um, report habits of grazing, evening grazing, yeah, so they have, maybe they have the dinner even at a normal time, 
What's normal? Um, so, well, it depends when you go to sleep. Yeah. Right. So, um, so I'd say, you know, dinner 7 p.m. would be a, an acceptable dinner. But eating earlier might be even better. Yeah. Although it's, it's really quite um, unlikely that, that, you know, people in professional environments are going to be able to have dinner before uh, 7 p.m. But certainly having dinner around 9 p.m. and finishing around 9.30, if you're then aiming to be in bed by half 10, that's too short a to allow the digestive pro uh, process to be completed and then allow for restorative sleep to... So how, how much time do we need between our last meal and going to sleep? A minimum three hours, ideally. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> so I go to bed at nine. That yeah. means really I need to be finishing dinner by six. Yeah. Which is what I've told my husband every day. Yeah. And, <laughs> So it's a, it's a problem. You're right. From a lifestyle point of view, cause I don't pick, like I, I go and pick him up after work and often it's after six that I pick him up. So dinner isn't before yeah. seven, therefore it's two hours or less before going to bed. Yeah. Sounds like a chronic pro challenge. Yeah. So that, that is a challenge. It can be challenging for people. So there are different things that we can do about it. And it really depends also what stage of life you're at. And, you know, people with young kids might be harder. So it really depends. But there are certain suggestions that can work. Um, firstly, you could actually lighten your dinner and turning the, the bulk of your eating into, you know, breakfast and lunch and perhaps having, you know, a, a more substantial mid-afternoon snack. And then dinner could be uh, vegetarian based. So more vegetarian, more carbohydrate based, like good quality carbohydrates, you know, not pizza um, and, you know, cream laden pasta, but, you know, perhaps, a, you know, brown rice based dish or a light vegetarian stir fry with some, you know, buckwheat noodles, something like that. And then utilizing portion control. Now, if you started the day just not having breakfast and just having a coffee or having a piece of toast on the run or a couple of wheat bix um, you're going to be building up a nutrient, particularly macronutrients in terms of your protein deficit throughout the day. So by the time you get home, you'll be starving because your brain is literally registering that you haven't eaten enough for the day. So you're not going to be able to switch things around until you actually intervene earlier on in the day. So literally just switching, you know, your dinner with breakfast in terms of quantity and density of nutrients. So things are stir fries, you know, vegetarian soups, those kinds of things. So you can still have the social aspect of the dinner, but you're eating less and you're eating lighter. This is a winner. I'm so excited about this. <laughs> I'm happy to eat more during the day because I get quite hungry. Mm -hmm. And, uh, and then if I just have a lighter meal, it doesn't matter as much when I eat it and I can still eat with my husband, which would be nice. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, absolutely. And, you know, the benefits from this also stem from the fact that it's not just impacting the quality of sleep, but actually we now know it's impacting also our metabolism and our ability to deal with sugar metabolism and uh, weight gain. So, you know, we talk a lot about fasting. Also, I mean, there is a lot of talk about fasting that, you know, people can access to improve wellness and, you know, lose weight. And it's really interesting to see that of all the kinds of fasts that, that help, the overnight fast actually is the most beneficial when there are some issues related to blood sugar metabolism. Okay. So, so what does that mean, overnight fast? So overnight fast means to basically having a, a longer time overnight when we're not eating. So, and the way to do that is to have either an earlier dinner or in some cases, skipping dinner altogether and just having uh, a late afternoon snack. Um, and, uh, um, and also perhaps you know, push it just a little bit later so that you end up with, you know, around a 16 hour window every day when we are not consuming, you know, food calories. So a lot of the new science around um, anti-aging and protecting our cells in time is actually related to the fact that we overconsume. It's not, it's no longer about just the quality of the food, but it's particularly the quantity and the timing of the food. And thinking that, you know, ancestrally, we just would not have had um, at our disposal the amount of calories that are widely available to us on a daily basis. So what happens is that 
if we were to think of, you know, our body as a, as a tool and you're just constantly using it. So every time we need, we eat food, we ex expend resources to break down that food. We have to produce enzymes to digest the food. Uh, we have to then absorb all the nutrients. We have to do the nutrients. We have to take, um, you know, the sugars out of the food and burn it or store it. All of that is really energy intensive and requires quite a lot of wear and tear from all the mechanism in our body. What we have found is that by allowing these, um, you know, regulated windows when we don't eat, our body goes into a process that's called autophagy. So it starts literally. <laughs> it sounds terrible. Itself. It, it does, doesn't it? Yeah, it's, it's basically self-eating, but oh. it's like saying, <laughs> it sounds cheap, doesn't it? <laughs> autophagy, you're eating yourself. Oh. yourself. Um, but it basically, you're giving yourself, your body, the chance to break down old scaffolding <laughs> and old frames that no longer work and building new ones. And, and that's, that really that's a good thing. That's a good thing to do. That, that's a good thing. It's the same as, you know, if you had a car and you never service it and you just keep going and going and going and you never stop to take the time to, you know, replace the tires, put the oil in, uh, you know, look at the electrics, all that kind of stuff. You, you know, eventually what's going to happen is that you will then have to spend thousands of dollars because something major is going to happen. But if you give that car the time to, um, to stop and not work and actually inputting some servicing and maintenance, that car will last you, you know, probably an extra five years, five, 10 years. So fasting is a way of allowing the body to ditch the old scaffolding crud that's in the way and <laughs> re-scaffold. <laughs> Love the crud. That's yeah. right. Get rid of the crud and the crusts and the scabs. <laughs> oh, man. Get some new fresh cells. Well, I have to say, like, I started doing the 16-8 fast probably in October last year. And it, it took a couple of weeks to adjust to. I couldn't make the full 16 hours at first because I get too hungry and would want to hit someone um, or something. Um, and then eventually, now it's fine. Like, today I broke my fast at 10 past 12 after finishing dinner at 7, <laughs> a little bit late. Um, and I was actually not that hungry, but I knew that I had a couple of things to do before I could eat again. So I'm like, oh, I got to eat now because I will be really hungry later. Yeah. But so the hunger factor goes. And so that has been fascinating because I've, I've always told myself I'm hypoglycemic. I need to eat every two hours or I go into this weird zombie land of yeah. first frustration and then brain weirdness. So what's your experience in working with clients who are similar to me where it's like, I got to eat, I got to eat. And now it's like, well, I can fast. I can do, I can, I do a weekly 24 hour fast as well. So what's, what's happening biochemically in the body with that? So I'd say, first of all, if you're thinking of adopting um, quite considerable fasting window, like the 16, eight, like you mentioned, or, um, you know, doing a 24 hour fast, which can be done in different ways, but you could do dinner to dinner. The first thing is, to um, have a quick checkup, you know, with your GP. And particularly you want to be looking at your fasting blood glucose. Yeah. Especially if there's a history of diabetes or, you know, in the past you become a bit shaky when you miss meals. Just want to get a little bit of that baseline reading because if you are pre-diabetic, which is very, very common um, in, in Australia and in the US, so pre-diabetic means that, you know, you're, you don't have as tight regulation on your blood sugar uh, when you fast and when you eat. And so you're kind of on your way to then having full-blown um, type 2, you know, late onset diabetes. So get, get that marker in and get your GP to say, yeah, that's, that's fine. That's all good. And then work out um, increasingly longer periods without fasting. So if you're someone who like you said, you know, you knew that you get really, really hung hungry or cranky. Some people can get headaches. Um, then the first thing to do is actually, first of all, look at the previous meal that you've had. Because if you've had the previous meal that was, you know, for example, cereal or a sandwich, yeah, um, it's going to be quite difficult for you to stretch the time between the meals, okay? Especially when initially you're not fat adapted so you're not as adapted to efficiently turn on fat as a source of fuel 
So preferentially, the body utilizes glucose from food, and we get basically glucose from two sources, either the food that we eat, yeah, or if there is no food, then it basically, um, you know, we can break down things in our body to turn into glucose. So we can even turn protein into, into glucose. Uh, or um, the body can start turning on, you know, fat as a source of, um, you know, production of energy. Okay. And then we produce ketones from there. So the first thing, look at the previous meal. And um, if you've had that problem, then increase the protein in that meal. Okay, so it could be having, you know, um, uh, make sure that there's, you know, a, a palm sized portion of protein, whether it's fish or chicken or tofu, if you're vegetarian, um, you know, a handful of nuts, and then see whether that allows you to go a little bit extra with it. In the initial stages, you might have to either shorten the window of the fasting or allow yourself a little bit of substance in between. So something like a green juice, for example might just be enough to do that or maybe like four or five nuts chewed slowly and you'll find that in time if you start timing the meals like i've said so having a more um you know uh, consider considerable meal in the morning that you will slowly become more adapted to that now if you have type 2 diabetes or you're on your way to diabetes you really need to do this under supervision because um you will have very poor regulation yeah, of, of this blood sugar supply. And, you know, you, you can become hypoglycemic, yeah. which is really, really dangerous. Um, or for example, for some, you know, diabetic clients, um, doing the long overnight fast does not work for them. They actually end up with really high fasting blood glucose levels because they have this rebound mechanism. So they might become hypo in the night without moving. So the body just releases masses of glucose <clears throat> to bring it back up. So but if you're well, absolutely, you know, we, we, we have fasted for, you know, <laughs> hundreds of thousands of years. And that's why we have got this ability to switch from burning glucose from carbohydrates to utilizing fat. You know, um, we are really very well adapted to do that. So does fasting help us move from being a glucose burner to more fat adapted? Is that one of the things that helps us move to doing that? Uh, it, it does. It doesn't mean that you need to stay in that sort of ketogenic phase forever. It's just that um, your body is going to get better, as you said, as switching between the fuel sources. And, and also, look, it, as I said, it depends on what the meal you've eaten beforehand. Yeah. So because that meal will still go to, if you've had carbohydrate based meal, you will still go to replenish your glycogen stores in your muscles. So glycogen is basically where sugar is stored. It's the first port of call where um, the sugar that, that's not been utilized for energy then gets stored. And it's stored in the liver and in the muscles. But it has a finite amount of space. So if you're not a bodybuilder who's got a massive muscle mass, you know, that glucose store is probably going to last you maybe, you know, 10 hours overnight, eight hours. Um, it really is sort of depends on, on the person. And so it's only once you have depleted that glycogen that then you're going to access, you know, that fat, um, yeah, for energy production. Okay. Well, that's good to know. Cause when we first started working together, you told me that, uh, I was not a good fat adapter and that my body was, um, basically breaking down my protein and my muscles to feed itself instead of using like my love handles. <laughs> So, so, so annoying, isn't it? I just want to get like the camera and go here. That's right. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So that's a simple blood test again that um, you know your listeners can have access to with the with their GP. So you're basically just looking at the ratio of something called urea to your creatinine. So you you basically want to get to around seventy percent of that ratio, and. Uh, um, you know, and I think at the time your ratio was, you know, which is very common, was around the, you know, 45%, 50% mark. So it just means that there was, you know, a lot of breakdown um, of the protein going on. Yeah, yeah. Well, hopefully we've improved that. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and look, and that's also really common. So common for a couple of, of reasons. First of all, um, it's more common in, in women. Yeah, because we just don't have as much bulk because um, we don't have as much testosterone as men. 
Um, it's also more common as we age because from age 30, we start decreasing muscle mass, um, uh, you know, year in, year out. And, uh, and then especially if you are pescatarian or vegetarian, where generally there's not as much protein in the diet uh, and more reliant on carbohydrates. So it's a combination of different factors, but it's super, super common. So the key tip is eat more protein. I, I think, I know this sounds like a real old hat thing, you know, from the 1980s, but um, generally speaking, you know, I do a lot of blood testing and um, the vast majority of people I see are actually undernourished when it comes to protein. And so, you know, they're really struggling to lose weight, but until you have redressed that balance, it's actually really, really hard to do. So if you're constantly focused on a carbohydrate-based diet, um, first of all, the body still makes you hungry. Yeah. So this has been proven that satiety, so feeling full, is best triggered by protein more than any other um, macro yeah, right. in the diet. Um, and so by, by, do, by doing that, by increasing the protein, especially in the early part of the day, you will find that you don't feel like snacking so much at night. Yeah, that's good. Mm. And you're right. I have, I've been tracking my macros in the app you told me to, the MyNet Diary one. Yeah. And consistently, day after day, it's like, not enough protein, not enough protein. I'm like, ah! <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Try yeah, and that's just, it's just a little bit harder, obviously, because if you have like 100 grams of chicken, yeah, um, it's, it's a lot easier to, to achieve than if you're relying on beans, for example. Beans and tofu and eggs and stuff. Yeah. yeah. Okay, cool. Well, so I've got another lasting, uh, last question for you. There's some tech stuff that's come out in terms of the ultra world, ultra wellness. Uh, <laughs> I need to develop a jingle every time I say it, then it's like the ultra wellness that comes out. Oh, that was good. That was good. <laughs> and I want your opinion on them. So the first one is infrared saunas. Infrared saunas. Mm -hmm. Are they useful? Are they better than regular saunas? That's the first question. Second question is around cryotherapy, where you stand in the in That's the little. That. Yeah. Okay. So yeah. let's start with with infrared saunas. What can you tell me about? the research yeah. around them. Yeah, I, I think infrared saunas are absolutely great. Um, you know, no one, not everyone can have a finished, the traditional finished sauna where you've got 80 to 100 degrees <laughs> in a wooden cabin uh, and, you know, then having access to, you know, Icelandic <laughs> conditions outside. So I think, you know, infrared saunas are, um, are really great. They work very, very well. It means that you can tolerate uh, staying in the sauna for a bit longer because the temperatures are generally between 45 and 60 degrees rather than 80 to 100. Mm. And um, they, they, they work really well. So the evidence is that they are very effective and the benefits are the same as having sort of a traditional uh, finished sauna. So they, they work on the principle that they are um, increasing your core temperature quite quickly. And that basically releases some... Um, you know, some proteins in the body that then turn on a number of mechanisms in, in our cells. So um, they increase um, something called nitric oxide, which we all have, and it's really beneficial for us because it's, it's uh, um, you know, it dilates our vessels. So it's really good for cardiovascular health. So all the benefits of the traditional sauna are, you know, are the same. So you will have increased heart rate, you will have increased flow uh, to, to the skin, uh, increased output from your heart so it's very very beneficial and they they have been shown to be a really good way to sweat out um, toxins so i recommend them when there is a history of heavy metals um, stored in the body my one caveat with um uh, with all saunas in general and and sweating in general so anything that increases your body temperature and sweats is to be mindful of your electrolyte intake. And this is because we're eating something like, you know, 70% less electrolytes in our diet than our ancestors did. How, how, how is that possible that we're eating less electrolytes? Mm. Because we're not eating as many, um, as much roughage, as many greens and as many vegetables. Oh. So the bulk of the diet would have been from kind of grazing then with, you know, intakes of, um, you know, meat following hunts. But overall, in terms of the amount of minerals, you know, potassium and magnesium, 
<clears throat> all these things would have been higher in the diet. And um, again, it's something that we see through the blood. So most people have a real imbalance of these electrolytes. And if you're sweating, then on top of that, you're going to be losing them more. So the things that reduce the electrolytes are a, a low plant-based diet. So if you're not having, you know, five, so we used to say five serves of veg a day. Okay. So it will be the equivalent of five cups of raw vegetables or a mixture of, of cooked veggies. We're now in terms of the space of ultra wellness and anti-aging, we're looking at nine to 12 serves per day. That's a lot. So first of all, not having the high plant intake. Secondly, stress, which, you know, you show me the man who's not stressed these days. <laughs> um, everybody is, is stressed. So that utilizes a lot of those electrolytes. <clears throat> um, and, uh, um, and then so overall we become, you know, quite, quite acidic. So then if you go and sweat or exercise a lot, um, that's going to deplete you even further. And, and the issue with that then is that you'll start seeing things like blood pressure rising, um, increased uh, stress response, so decreased resilience, increased anxiety. And some people, when they get really, really low and they've got a genetic tendency, they can even go into panic attacks. And that's just can purely be resolved with electrolytes. Hmm. So I'd say if you've got a regular sauna practice, just get yourself electrolytes, good quality electrolytes without, you know, neon colors and, you know, sugars in it. And then just sit that throughout your sauna session. Okay. That's, that's good to know. <laughs> I didn't know about the electrolyte piece. So let's talk about cryotherapy, which is, if you haven't heard of this before, it's an upright capsule looking thing that shoots liquid nitrogen around you and deep freezes your body for about three minutes. Did I get that right? And how does it work? And yeah, absolutely. Spot on. Tell me, tell me about, what do you think about this practice? Yeah. yeah, look, I'm, I'm a little bit dubious about it in terms of looking at your evidence, looking at the scientific evidence, but anecdotally, I do know people who have done it and, you know, have lost some centimeters if you want to think of it in, in those terms. Okay. However, it, you know, it comes back. So there's a bit of that anecdotal evidence. Now looking at the actual scientific evidence, this has come from studies based on athletes and the management of injury and, and inflammation post-injury with application of ice packs. So first of all, the difference is that in that traditional management, it was done with actual skin exposure. So um, the, the ice pack would be placed actually on the tissue, whereas these zap fat machines are actually based on, as you said, you know, nitrogen based. So it's the air around the body rather than actual contact on the skin. Mm. So the evidence is that um, ice application works incredibly well to interrupt pain um, communication to the brain. Yeah. And it also reduces, <clears throat> if done quickly, the level of inflammation because it slows down the white cells going to the injury. Okay. So there's going to be less swelling and a faster recovery. As to the actual evidence that this does anything to fat, <clears throat> I, I haven't seen it. I'm not saying it's not out there, but you know, I even did the recent search to, to prepare for the podcast and I couldn't really find anything that's related but um so i i would say you know you can try it there have been some concerns um in the states about potential injuries you know and skin burns and that kind of stuff but i'm sure that it's done you know within a, a professional context that it's done quite well so you know it's something that people could try um i just don't know at the moment we don't really have the evidence to say either way yeah well, I was wondering about that. There's a place down the road that offers cryotherapy and it's got a new treatment, which is like spot cryotherapy where they use a wand mm. and they, they basically apply the liquid nitrogen against your, your fat deposits right. to get rid of your cellulite. So the theory is that it freezes, yes. freezes the, the cells and then they mm -hmm. burst and the body gets rid of them. I'm like, that's yeah. that nasty. <laughs> Yeah, it sounds nasty. And as I said, you know, I've, I've really, um, I've heard anecdotally that it's worked very well for some people. Obviously, just treat it like a Band-Aid because it's not really addressing the reason why those fat deposits are there in the first place. Um, but, you know, you could, you, I think you should give it a go and then report back and let us know, <laughs> A, is it painful? Because <laughs> it sounds painful. <laughs> it does sound painful. Like, it sit in minus 800, which is what they say it is, for three yeah. minutes. I'm like... 
I, yeah. I, I should be like right. One. You can, you Canadian. That's your spring, isn't it? <laughs> oh, I'm a wussy Canadian. Why do you think I'm living in Australia? My goodness, I complain when it gets to like ten degrees here. That's above zero. All right. Well, I'll consider putting my uh, butt on the as a road tester for you, Alessandra. You're so, you're so generous. I, I just love the generosity of your spirit that always comes from this woman. <laughs> oh, I love it. So I'll, um, yeah, my butt can be the test dummy for this one and <laughs> we'll see how it goes. I'll have to take before and after pictures. We may not publish these. <laughs> I, I think that you should take a friend actually to do, to be the control <laughs> and they're in a capsule that's placebo. So they just, they, they, they get the cold, but there's no, not as much cold and then see what happens. <laughs> yeah. Right. So I wonder if you can do the treatment without actually, yeah, the placebo effect. Okay. Maybe I'll just do that and see yeah. if I can <laughs> mentally imagine my fat yeah. frozen. <laughs> yeah, that sounds much cheaper too. These, I mean, this process is not, it's not cheap, that's for sure. It's expensive. Well, next time you have, sorry, that could go on, but I think next time you have a ski trip to Japan, just go and sit on a glacier. <laughs> I'll just strip down and just yeah. sit outside the outside the inn uh, and just wave at the Japanese people yeah. being my ha, ha, I'm just working on my cellulite okay uh, we've gone we've gone off a little bit of uh, yeah probably a good time to end <laughs> <laughs> I, I like to keep a high standard <laughs> <laughs> it always comes down to talking about ass <laughs> oh dear all right well Alessandra thank you so much um as always, you have in-depth knowledge about all the things that are amazing when it comes to executive high performance. And I so look forward to you um, coming to the Unconference and speaking to our, our people who are going to be there at the end of this month, end of March. That's coming up soon. And uh, we're doing some pre-assessments before we get there. And I'm looking to taking a deep dive with all of our attendees with you. So thank you so much. Wonderful. It's been great. <laughs>